Just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, good, good. Well, rather than right away tell you what I'm gonna speak about this morning, um, I'm gonna give you a little quiz and give you some clues to see if you can figure it out, just for fun. Um, so what am I? So what am I talking about? And here's, here's the first clue. Um, you can look at the picture behind you, behind this uh, on the left there, uh, a field. And by the way, just uh, feel free to unmute yourself or just send a, a message in the chat if you think you know what I'm going to talk about. Fields are ripe under harvest. Good guess, but not yet. Um, so the next clue is um, the birth of a lamb. Okay, the next clue, a wedding, celebration or a wedding invitation. Grapes on a vine. Family photo. And the last clue, a person with a head and a body. <laughs> what am I talking about? Well, you may have guessed uh, the church. And those, those are all different pictures used of the church in the New Testament. What I'd like to do today is kind of take a, a bird's eye view, a little bit like Ted did with Isaiah last week. And sometimes we get into the, the details, um, but um, we, we tend to lose the, um, the big picture. And I'm a detail person, so we're gonna to try to just take an overview and see what does the church look like in the New Testament? What, what was the church like? What are some of the things that they really focused on? And uh, maybe time for self-examination. Are, are we doing those things? Are there ways that we can improve? Are there ways that I can improve? So that's what I wanna focus on uh, this morning. So the first big idea that I see in, in the New Testament church is that it's all about Jesus which shouldn't come as a surprise to us, but let's just, just have a little overview um, of what the New Testament church did and, and focused and how they focused on the Lord Jesus. The New Testament, of course, wasn't written when the church was born, uh, but as the, the prophets and the apostles spoke and, and taught and it was later written down and recorded in the New Testament, we see that throughout the New Testament, what was written and what was practiced was all about Jesus. The Gospels were the historical account of Jesus' life on earth. Uh, the Acts were examples of the church preaching Jesus. The rest of the New Testament letters were all about explaining Jesus as our life. And then finally, the book of Revelation tells us that Jesus is coming back. So it's all about him. Let's look at the Gospels in a little more detail. Um, and we see that in the Gospel of Matthew, there's a connection to the Old Testament to see how Jesus connects to the Old Testament, to the previous revelation of God and, and to the Jewish people. And also that God promised the Messiah King. And now finally, he, he had come. And of course, the challenge for us is to live under the, the rule of our King, the Lord Jesus. Well, Mark looks at Jesus in a different way. He sees him as a servant. Uh, Remy referred to him earlier in that way from Isaiah 53. And Jesus' life of service was the example of, to the early church. And that, that as the, the church committed itself uh, to serving others. Luke sees him in dependence upon the Holy Spirit and all that he did, even though he was God. And Luke is the example to the early church and to us of how to live the Christian life in dependence 
upon the Spirit of God. And we'll look up at that a little later. And then finally, the Gospel of John is Jesus' mission to give eternal, abundant life to all who believe. And for those of us who, who are believers, we have received that life and we want to know it more uh, and we want to share it with others as well. So the Gospels are all about Jesus, but so is the book of Acts. And here the emphasis is on the church preaching about Jesus. Um, turn to Acts chapter 2, and there we see um, the, the early apostles going from being really afraid to being really bold and preaching Jesus raised from the dead and Lord of all. And um, incidentally, the, the church was something that was, that was new. Uh, there was no church in the Old Testament. Um, Paul says it was a mystery that was yet to be revealed. Um, and the Lord Jesus said, I will build my church. So it was future still. But now the church has begun and the Holy Spirit has, has come. And in Acts 2, verse 22, this is what Peter says. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, God delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again and put an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. And down to verse 36, at the end of his sermon, Peter says this, therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And then finally, uh, in verse 38, Peter concludes his message by giving them a challenge. He says, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When they totally changed their mind and, and agreed with God and, and believed in his son, they were forgiven. They received the Holy Spirit and then as an act of obedience, they were baptized. They also healed people. They were given the, the, the ability to heal, but they did it in Jesus' name. And we see that in Acts chapter 3. We won't look at that, that particular verse. And then in Acts chapter 9, we see that they witnessed many, many people, some of them enemies of God, turning and following Jesus as a result of this preaching. Jesus, let's look at Acts chapter 9 just for a moment. It's the first of several accounts of Saul's conversion, Saul who became Paul. And it says in verse 4 of Acts chapter 9, And he, that Saul, fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And on that day, Saul was, was converted. He was saved. He was born again. And God greatly used him uh, in, the, uh, in, in those days and, and years in the early part of the church. And in fact, we have um, the New Testament largely written by, by Paul um, today. So we, the Gospels... The, the book of Acts, the New Testament letters, so the letters written to churches and individuals, most of the rest of the New Testament, explain to us that Jesus is our life. And I've just chosen three verses here. You can see them on the screen if you're able to, to see the screen. Um, I'll read them to you. Colossians 3.3 3 says, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Not only did Christ die for us, but the, 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 the New Testament tells us that we died with him. We were buried and we were raised to new life. 
We have the life of God in us. The power of sin has been broken over us. And now God says we're hidden with Christ in God. We're already seated in heaven. Paul in Philippians 1.21 says this, For to me, to live is Christ. And for him, life was all about Christ and about knowing him. And finally, in Galatians 2.20, Paul says this, It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And here Paul's focus is on the fact that Christ lives in me. And by faith, uh, he enables me to live the way he wants me to. The Gospels and the New Testament letters show this relationship between Jesus and his people in a lot of different ways. These are just some of them. Uh, but Christ is the, the head of the body. And just as in a human body, the head, the, the brain controls the body and enables it to function properly. Christ wants to control his new body, the church, of which we're, we're part if we know him. But it means that we have to listen to him um, and so that the body is healthy and grows and functions the way it's supposed to. He is the chief cornerstone and also the foundation of the temple. He's, he's the foundation. The church is built on him. Uh, and God is building the church with living stones, with you and I, people that have been, that have been uh, purchased for God. And now he's building a place where God is to be worshipped. And the church is a place of worship, not just a, a place where we go to, but the church, the, the people are to be people who are worshipers of God. And even our bodies, um, the Bible says, are temples of God. So wherever I go as a Christian, God is to be worshipped and can be worshipped. He's the shepherd of the sheep. Uh, and this shepherd uh, loved us to such an extent that he was willing to, to sacrifice his own life to purchase us and to bring us into that sheepfold. And a biblical shepherd does at least three things. He leads the sheep, he feeds the sheep, and he protects the sheep. And that's what our Savior does for us. But we need to listen to his voice and follow him. He's the bridegroom of his bride. And as a church, we are awaiting, we are awaiting for our, our wedding. Um, all of us are going to be married to him. And as a bride waits for the, the bridegroom and anticipates the wedding, just as I'm sure Nathan and Adelie are anticipating their wedding day uh, later this month. We're to be waiting and watching and yearning for the time we, we will be married to him and, and to know him in his fullness. He's the commander in chief of the soldiers. And even though in this war, he has already, he's already won the war, he's defeated all of our enemies. The flesh has been defeated. Um, the world has been defeated. Satan has been defeated. They just don't realize it yet. Um, and as soldiers, when, when we listen to his commands and take orders from him, um, we're able to live in victory, put on his armor, and, and accomplish his work in light of his previous victory already. He's the farmer of the field. He's the eldest brother of the family. And we look to him to, to understand what it means to be part of God's family. And he's the life of the branches. Uh, we don't want anything to prevent his life from flowing into us and through us. Uh, John 15, it says that we need to uh, abide in him, to remain in him, to stay close to him. Read, read his word. Think about it. Trust it. And trust ourselves to him. And his life flows through us for our own blessing and the blessing of others. So it's all about our relationship with him, uh, his life in us. The church soon recognized that as it says in Colossians 1.18, he himself will come to have first place in everything. Your translation may say that he will come to have the, the preeminence. That's what it means to have the first place. 
And just as the, the, the early church put Jesus in first place, and, and we see how he was able to work through them, um, he wants us to do that as a church as well. Their motto came to be Jesus Christ is Lord. Not Caesar is Lord, but Jesus Christ is Lord. And is he, is he our Lord? Is he my Lord as well? So we move on to the, the end of the, the Bible, the book of Revelation. But really, the book of Revelation and almost every New Testament letter, except for four, specifically tell us that Jesus is coming back. Uh, and those four letters that don't specifically say it talk about our, our hope. So what do we learn? We learn that we don't give up. He is coming soon. From Hebrews 10, 37. Persevere. He's coming back. Hang in there. Number two, he will take his church to heaven before things turn really bad here on earth. And uh, Paul to the Thessalonians said that he, he to, to, to keep us from the, the wrath to come. God's judgment upon the earth and future judgment as well. And in chapter four of 1 Thessalonians, we see a beautiful description of him coming to the clouds and taking his church away, taking us to heaven to a place of safety to enjoy um, our honeymoon with him. Um, while there are seven terrible years on earth described in Matthew 24, the, the tribulation period. Finally, we will return with him and the armies of heaven, Revelation 19, and he will come as King of Kings and Lord of all Lords and put an end to the, uh, the attacks of the, the world armies upon the nation of Israel and will set up a kingdom for a thousand years and there will be peace and righteousness. And finally, a new heavens and a new earth uh, in which righteousness dwell. Every eye, it says, will see him when he comes back, whether those who believe and those who don't believe. And he will come to rule in the, in the right way. Finally, at the end of Book of Revelation, in fact, three times in Revelation, he says, I am coming quickly. Second last verse of the Book of Revelation chapter 22, um, he says, I am coming quickly. And the church responds. The church and the spirit respond by saying, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. How do we respond? Well, until he returns, we don't give up. The early church didn't give up. And we're encouraged not to give up either. We're to long for his appearing. Paul tells this to Timothy in the in his last letter before he was killed, 2 Timothy 4, 8. The crown of righteousness given to all those who long for his appearing. And secondly, we determine to follow him, as we read in Hebrews 12, 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus. He fixed his eyes on what was yet future, seeing all these people saved, a bride purchased for himself. We fix our eyes on him allowing us to get through the difficulties of our present circumstances and situations. And thirdly, we look carefully for him in the word of God, 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we'll look more at this later. But as we see him in the word of God, we're encouraged and the spirit of God transforms us to become like him. So all, all of the New Testament church's focus was on Jesus. Everything was about their relationship with him. So, number two, another big idea in the early church recorded in the New Testament. We see that they were living in the spirit. What does that mean? First of all, Jesus promised a couple of things while he was still with his disciples. First, he promised to build his church, and we referred to that earlier. He says, I will build my church. It was yet future, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. He also promised to send his Holy Spirit, first of all, to be in the disciples, see this in John 14, and then to empower them to witness 
in Acts chapter 1. Combining these two promises, we see the birth of the church, the fulfillment of these two promises in Acts chapter 2. Exactly 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, the church was born. The church was born and the Spirit of God was sent. Uh, let's turn to Acts chapter 2. Uh, if you're still in the book of Acts, turn back to chapter 2. And I'd like to read the first four verses of chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. They were told to wait for the Spirit, and now the Spirit of God descended upon them in this unique way. Um, they were enabled to speak languages they'd never spoken before. So these Jewish people from all over the world could hear the gospel in their own language. And they were filled and controlled by the Holy Spirit. I want to turn over to 1 Corinthians 12, which is kind of Paul's commentary, I think, on what happened that first day when the church began. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 in verse 13. A really helpful verse. And Paul says, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slave or free, it doesn't matter what your background is before you were Christian. And we were all made to drink of one spirit. And so we see the spirit of God creating the church, this new spiritual entity. We can't see the church in a sense. Uh, we can't see our connection to each other, but we sense it. The spirit of God has created a connection between us and God and between us and every believer. And we can sense that connection even when we meet believers for the first time. So we've been baptized, we've, we've been immersed, we've been placed into this new entity called the church, every believer. Uh, and, and the spirit of God has done that work and is going to keep it together. So how did this newly formed church live then? Well, just like Jesus did in the, in the gospel of Luke, in dependence upon the spirit of the living God. I want to look at a few things briefly that the Spirit of God uh, does, both bringing us to salvation and, and as Christians, what he does for us um, as the church to, to know him and to know his life and to know the life of Christ. First of all, the Spirit convicts spiritually lost people of their need to be saved. Even before I was a Christian, the Spirit of God, um, John says, was working in the world in John 16, verses 7 and 8, three things that the Spirit of God is doing. He's convicting lost people of their sin. He's convicting them of the need for righteousness that they don't have and of judgment to come. Um, if you go back to Acts chapter 2 for a minute, at the end of Peter's sermon, um, this is what we see in Acts 2, 37. As a result of the sermon, it says, now when they heard this, the, the Jewish people listening to him, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? The spirit of God had brought conviction upon them. The second thing that happens is that he causes us to be experience a spiritual rebirth. And uh, if you keep your finger here, and just turn or, or listen as I read John 3, verse 5, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. It's impossible. He cannot. And I take this to mean that the water is, is our, our natural birth. We were born a first time. 
but by the spirit, we have to be born a second time in order to enter the, the kingdom of God. And this is what happened on that day uh, of Pentecost when the church was born and Peter preached. And we see in verse 41 of Acts 2, the response of those people that the spirit had convicted. He says, so then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day they were added about 3000 souls. So first of all, they were convicted by the spirit. They received the word. In other words, they, they believed that it was true. And they asked for that forgiveness. They received the Holy Spirit as well. And as a, an act of obedience, uh, they were baptized and brought into the, into the church fellowship. But there's so much more now that the Spirit of God begins to do in the life of the believer and the life of the church. And we see this lived out in the early church. So number three, the Spirit of God began to live permanently inside every new believer. He became their life. Once, and I'm going to read from Ephesians 1.13. Once God saves me and forgives me, I belong to him forever. And you say, well, how do, how do you know that? Well, many, many different verses. But this one verse I'd like to read in Ephesians 1.13. And it says, in him, that's in Jesus Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. And the seal in, in those days meant that you belonged to that person. The seal indicated ownership. And if God sealed us by the spirit, that means we now belong to God. I belong to God. Uh, and so the spirit of God came to live in permanently. In fact, in Romans 8, we won't turn there, but Paul says, if you don't have the spirit of God, you don't belong to Jesus Christ. The spirit of God permanently lives inside every believer. And that's how he can work. We see in, in number four, uh, he also enabled them to understand and obey the scriptures. In 1 Corinthians 2, it tells us that the scriptures are spiritually discerned and we can't naturally understand them. But when the spirit of God comes and lives inside an individual, he enables me to understand the scriptures. And I remember when I got saved, um, a second year of university, I had been reading the Bible, but I didn't understand it really. Um, but the moment I was saved, it's like all the lights suddenly went on in the room and I was able to understand the scriptures because now the spirit of God was living inside me. But not only does he enable us to understand the scriptures, but to obey them. Um, turn with me back to Romans chapter eight and verse 13. And here Paul emphasizes uh, the Spirit's work in obedience. And he says, For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to, de to death the deeds of the body, you will live. As the Spirit of God living inside me, my sin nature, of course, has been broken. We see that in Romans chapter 6. The Spirit of God now enables me as I trust in, in him and in the promises of God to obey the scriptures and to live in a way that pleases God. But it just gets better. And in the early church, we saw even more. Number five, God's Holy Spirit began to make them more like Jesus in character and behavior. And uh, turn with me for a minute to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And the Apostle Paul here is talking about the work of the Spirit to make us more like Christ. Let me read it. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, 
are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the spirit. It sounds a little confusing at first, but if we look at the mirror as the word of God, and we are looking into that mirror, normally what we see in the mirror is, is what's true of us, it's just the, the mirror image of it. Um, but the mirror reflects the person standing in front of it. But in this case, it's the exact opposite. In the mirror, which is the word of God, we see pictures and, and glimpses of Jesus Christ. And as the spirit of God helps us to understand who Jesus is like, we become what we see in the mirror. We become more like him, both in our character and our behavior. And others start to, to take notice that we too have been with Jesus. The spirit of God does even more. Point number six, he also controlled or filled the new believers as they surrendered every part of their lives to him. Ephesians 5 commands us to be filled with the spirit. In other words, to, to, to put ourselves into his hands, to allow him to control us. And we can only do that, of course, as we fulfill the command in Romans 12, 1 to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to God, to say, here, Lord, use me, raised from the dead, use me for yourself, control me and, and fill me. Next, God's spirit enabled the believers to strengthen other believers, right? He's put us into this new community, this, this body, the, the, the church, we're connected to God and to every other believer. And in the local church, he's designed it. So he's given each of us a spiritual ability, spiritual gift that when used in God's, under God's direction will spiritually encourage and equip and build up the other believers in my church. And we see the, the, the New Testament church using their, their gifts and, and building each other up uh, according to the gifts given to them by God. I need to be using the gift that God has given me. Sometimes we say, well, there's nothing for me to do. Well, there is. I don't know what it is, but God has given each of us, each of you, um, a spiritual gift, a way of building up and encouraging and equipping other Christians. And he wants us to use them so that the, the body is built up. And so we're functioning and maturing and working the way we're supposed to. And finally, the spirit of God enabled them to be powerful witnesses to the risen savior. And we see that throughout the book of Acts and, and the New Testament. Um, all about Jesus living in the power of the spirit. And the last big idea that I'd like just to focus on for a few minutes is we see the, the New Testament church loving God and loving one another. <clears throat> the Bible tells us that God is love. Uh, the Apostle John tells us that in his first epistle. It's the very character of who God is. It's, it's his nature. God is love. But it wasn't just fuzzy, warm, fuzzy feelings that God had for us. God demonstrated, he proved, he, sh he showed his love by acting and his love sent his only son uh, into death and into, into judgment so that the enemies of God could become. Could become the children of God. And that's, that's the extent, that's the kind of love with which God has loved us and which with, with which the Lord Jesus has loved us because he obeyed the Father and he came and he died as our substitute. So how do we respond to the love of God? God has demonstrated, he, he's shown it clearly. Well, we respond in faith by believing in Jesus Christ and receiving him as our, our own savior. And then we respond in love to him. Uh, John says, we love because he first loved us. 
And so our, our response to him is, is, you know, Lord, you've done it all for me. How can I not love you? He says, good, good. This is what I want you to do. How does God expect us to love him? Well, at a most basic level, he says, obey my commandments. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. John 14, 21. It's not an external obedience like, like the Old Testament law. This is the law. This is what I must do. Now it becomes an internal obedience because the law was outside of us. But now the spirit of God lives within me. God himself lives within me. He's given me a nature that's like his. He's given me a desire and an ability to obey. So I obey not because I have to, but because I want to. Uh, it, it's the only reasonable response to all that God has done for us. So let's get practical. How does this practically work out? What did the New Testament church do? What should we do as the church in 2021? To love God means uh, a, a few things. Number one, I will offer my body to him for his exclusive use. Romans 12, 1. We've already talked about that. Living sacrifice. Lord, take my, take my body. It's only reasonable in light of what you've done for me. Number two, I will no longer live for myself. My mind, my will, my possessions, my family, my job, my service to God. It all belongs to him now. Second Corinthians chapter 5, Paul talked about us no longer living for ourselves, but for him who died for us and rose again. Here, God, take everything that belongs to me and, and use it. That's, that's what I want to do. That's how I want to love you. Number three, to use my money to care for others. And in 2 Corinthians 8, we see this. There was a need. There, there was a famine in, in Judea. And Paul was encouraging the churches to set aside money so he could collect it and take it to help these, these needy believers buy, buy food. A group of believers called the, uh, the Macedonians were very poor, and yet they earnestly desired to give some money, even though they had so little, because they first gave themselves to the Lord, and then out of that they gave. Love for God will, will prompt us to use the, the money, the time, the resources, everything that, that God has given to us for the blessing of others. Not neglecting ourselves, obviously, but being generous as God has been generous to us. Number four, if you're a husband, you will put your wife's interests before your own, just as Christ put my interests, our interests, before his, Ephesians chapter five. And number six, number five, sorry. I will serve my brothers and sisters in Christ in the spirit of Jesus love and not harshly. This is something I'm still learning, but um, as I said, each one of us has a, a spiritual gift that God wants us to use to, to, to edify, to build up and equip other believers. But if I use it in a harsh loveless way, it will accomplish nothing and bring disaster and heartache. But at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and into the next chapter, he says, now I will show you a more excellent way. And this is the way of love, using the gift, but tempered and, and motivated by the love of Christ for my brothers and sisters and serving in, in that way. And that will definitely bear fruit. Uh, he expects us to work hard because after all, it is a labor of love, labor. It's hard work, but the spirit of God will, will enable us to serve and to love. And finally, he says, this is a demonstration of my love, laying down my life for my brothers and sisters in Christ, there's John. 316. Love one another. It's repeated over and over in the New Testament. We see it lived out by the early Christians. We see it commanded by Paul 
Peter, John, the author to the Hebrews. Paul says, speak the truth in love. Paul says that the goal of teaching, in fact, is to produce more love, loving obedience in the lives of those who listen. Paul says, do all in love. And finally, in Ephesians 5, 2, he says, live a life of love, just as Christ did. Uh, how can I love like God does? How can I love this way? Well, to, to borrow the words from Matthew 19, 26, with people, this is impossible. We, we just can't do it. But the verse goes on to say, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. And what makes it possible is what we read in, in Romans 5, 5. His love has been poured into our hearts by the spirit who was given to us. The life of God is inside us. The spirit of God is inside us. We're no longer slaves to our sin nature, nor to, to the world or the devil. And the spirit of God living inside us is able to produce and to fuel that love for God. And can enable us to, to love others as God has loved us. And if you're like me and you think, I love so little, I have such a small understanding of God's love for me. We can pray like the Apostle Paul did. And maybe we'll just turn there um, as, we, as we close to Ephesians chapter 3. Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. And we'll start at verse uh, 16. That he, that's God, would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell, feel at home in your hearts through faith. And that you being rooted and grounded in love would be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know, to know experientially the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. To pray for a, a more complete understanding of the love of God, you know, the experiencing his love and being able to demonstrate it uh, to other people. The results of love, others are spiritually equipped, spiritually equipped and, and refreshed the church grows in Christ likeness and maturity. Unbelievers take notice. All men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And God is pleased. Ephesians 5.2. It's like a, a beautiful aroma, like the most wonderful perfume in the nostrils of God when he sees his children loving and living a life of love like Christ did. So as we wrap up this morning, uh, we've looked at three big ideas uh, that we see in the New Testament church and that God desires to see in every local church. It's all about Jesus living in the spirit and loving God and one another. Thank you for listening. Randy, do you want me to close in prayer or do you want to do that? Me? Okay. All right.